This is Keith with CADSharp.com, and in this short video I want to show you how you can use equations to run macros that are embedded in your part. This undocumented capability, which I call equation-triggered macros, provides two great benefits. First, it allows a macro to run as long as a part or assembly is open. Second, it allows the macro to travel with the document. For example, let's consider a problem I received from a friend a few weeks ago. His parts need to have their custom properties listed in alphabetical order. Right now I have a macro that sorts the custom properties alphabetically. If I want to sort the custom properties, I have to always run this macro. Using equation triggered macros, however, I no longer have to run the macro myself because the part will run the macro for me automatically. So let me demonstrate this macro for you real quick. If I go into the custom properties, Let's uh, add another custom property called finish. And if I click OK and I go back into the custom properties right now, of course, it's not going to be listed alphabetically automatically. So instead, I need to run this macro. And then if I come back, there you see that finish was moved just above division and below material. So now it's alphabetical. But using equation triggered macros, I don't have to run the macro manually. So let me demonstrate that. I'm going to open up another part that already has the macro embedded. And if I go to File, Properties, and then add Finish, and then click OK, I'll rebuild the part. And now when I go back into Properties, notice it's automatically listed in the appropriate spot. Practically, this means that I can send this part to a coworker and the macro will run for him or her as well. So no longer must I worry about teaching my coworkers how to use the macro, or worry about them forgetting to use the macro, or worry about whether they have the macro at all. The macro will always run, and the custom properties will always be sorted alphabetically. So the question becomes, how do you set up equation-triggered macros in your own parts or assemblies? Well, first of all, let's close out of this and go back to the part that doesn't have the equation triggered macro in it yet. And the first thing we need to do is actually write the macro that performs whatever task we want. So in our case, I have it uh, right here, sort custom properties. And so basically you can write this, test it, make sure it's working properly. And then what you're going to do in your part is you're going to go to the design binder and you're going to right click on it and go to add attachment and let's browse for the file so there's my SWP file and don't click link just click OK and now it's embedded in the document so it will travel with the document but this by itself simply embeds it it doesn't ensure anything about the macro ever running to actually get the macro to run, we need to use an equation. And this is kind of the secret trick behind this whole method, and of course it's why it's called equation triggered macros. Basically what you can do with equations is you can actually run VBA code from equations. And so in our case we're going to run an API call called ISLDWorks run attached macro, and we're going to point to the macro we just put in the design binder. So since an equation gets recalculated on every rebuild, when that equation with VBA code gets recalculated, the VBA code will be run, and therefore it will run the macro in the design binder. So how are we going to do this? Well, basically in 2012 and later versions, the syntax checker doesn't like VBA code in equations, and so it's not very effective if you try to paste in the code manually or type it in manually. Instead, what I would recommend you doing is actually putting the code in a text file and then importing it. So first, let me show you what the code looks like. Um, I actually have two equations in here, but right now let's just worry about the first one. Basically, the variable name is arbitrary. You just need to have some variable name. And then a variable always needs to have a value. So that's what the one is for. But again, this is arbitrary. It could be any other value. And then since this equation is recognized as VBA code, we can use the double colons to create a new line. And so on the second line, that's where we're going to use ISLDWorks run attached macro. 
and in equations the variable SWAP is recognized as a pointer to ISLDWorks. So we're going to run this API call and you can check this out in the API help for more details but I'll give a quick rundown of the arguments. There's only three. The first one is the name of the macro that you're trying to run that's in the design binder. And so in our case we need to change this to sort cust props. And then the second argument is the module um, that you want to point to and then within that module the subprocedure you want to point to. So let me save this and let me go back to the actual code just so you can see what I'm referring to exactly with the arguments. There's the module in main and then within in main is my subprocedure main and basically I'm saying start the macro there, run this first. So let's actually import that text file. And we'll go ahead and not do the second one right now. So we're going to import it and it's going to give us a warning saying that it doesn't like it, but that's okay. It's still going to work. So go ahead and click yes when you get this box. And basically, now that I added that um, equation, it should have automatically sorted all the properties and we can see that it did. So previously they were unsorted in this part and then if we go and add another one of course it will be sorted as well as soon as a rebuild occurs and we have to do a rebuild because that's when the calculations get recalculated. Now as cool as this technique is it might not fit everyone's scenario exactly so I want to consider two questions that you might be asking. First is there a way to run a macro that is still located on my hard drive or network? Second, is there a way to run a macro when an event other than a rebuild occurs? So let's consider the first question first. So the answer to both questions is yes, and I'm going to show you a few more really great examples of how to accomplish each. For the first question, the reason you might want to run a macro that is located on your hard drive or network rather than the design binder is because if the macro is embedded in the design binder in say 100 parts and you want to change the code in all of those parts then you have a lot of work ahead of you because basically you have to right click, delete, modify the code and then re-add. But by linking the macro rather than embedding it, you can quickly and easily implement changes to your code. Now there is a way to link to macros using the design binder, but I want to show you a technique that actually excludes the design binder entirely and still lets us reference external macros. So in order to show you referencing, I'm actually going to close out of this part and show you another example. And basically in this part uh, what's going on is we have uh, six solid bodies and we want them to be named something else. So normally they're named after whatever feature modified them last but a lot of times people will ask me can I have them named something else and you, and you can't really do that easily without the help of a macro. And of course we want that macro to always be running alongside the part so you don't have to run the macro manually. So right now I have a macro that renames uh, these bodies according to like body1, body2, body3, and so on, and it's located in the temp folder on my C drive. So I'm not going to add any macro to the design binder at all. Instead, I'm just going to go down to equations, go to manage equations, and we'll go to import again, but this time we're going to use the second equation. So let's take a look at that real quick. First of all, again, we have some arbitrary name that it's equal to, and then we have the value it will be equal to. Then the next line is where we're dimensioning a variable that will be used in the final argument of ISLDWorks run macro 2. And so in the third line, when we use ISLDWorks run macro 2, we have five arguments. And this API call is different from run attached macro in that it runs a macro at a specified location on your hard drive or network instead of running a macro from the design binder. So the first argument we have to specify the location on the hard drive or network and in our case it's temp and rename bodies and the cool thing about run macro 2 is you can actually use it with .NET macros so you're not just limited to SWP files. You can also do DLLs. 
Again, we need to specify the module and then the subprocedure we want to start with. This is saying that we'll run the macro um, in default mode, and if you want to see what other options are available there, you can check out the API help. And then lastly is where we're using our variable that we defined on the second line. So let's save that, and I'll import this, and just import the second one. And again, it's not going to like it. The syntax checker is going to say that the equation is incorrect, but we'll go ahead and click OK anyway, and it should accept it. If it doesn't, like this, then what I would recommend you do is reopen the part and try to re-add it again. And if you're still having trouble even after that, then go to our blog post because I have a few more tips on how you can get it to be accepted. Okay, so there it was accepted. And now if we go to solid bodies, you see that they've been renamed body one, two, three, and so on. And that occurred automatically without me even having to hit the rebuild button because as soon as you add an equation, it rebuilds the part. So let's go ahead and test this out though by adding another body. So that will be a seventh body and it should be called body seven and we see that it is. So this is a cool little macro that lets you rename bodies and that's your demonstration of not only embedding but now referencing a macro. So now let's consider the second question. Is there a way to run a macro when an event other than a rebuild occurs? And the reason you might want to do this is because sometimes you don't want your macro to run during rebuild. Maybe you want it to run when a save as occurs, or maybe you just want it to run on the first rebuild. So basically when the part opens, but never on any subsequent rebuild. So basically if we want to run a macro when other events occur, then we need to use event notifications. And event notifications require a special listener class that listens for the event to occur and then runs the code you want. Using equation triggered macros, this listener class will be started when a rebuild occurs. So in our next example, I'm going to close out of this and I'm going to open up an assembly. And basically in this assembly, I have a macro that is embedded that waits until the user saves the document before running the code. So again, don't be confused that we're in an assembly. I'm just showing you an example that works in an assembly. But in our case, we don't want this macro to run every rebuild. We only want it to run when the user causes a save event from doing file save or file save as. And when that event occurs, the code determines the number of instances of each component and then updates a custom property in the component and tracks the number of times that that component is used in the assembly. So for example, I'll create another instance of this knob and I'll do a save. And you can see it took a little bit longer to save there because it was running that macro. But now if we go in here and go to the custom property, you see that there's a custom property named after the assembly and the value is the number of times this crank knob appears in that assembly. So likewise, if we added this to another assembly and ran that macro, there would be another custom property added. Now in our last example, I want to show you how you can only have the macro trigger on the first rebuild and then never again. So let me close out of this and we'll open up this guy. And as soon as I open this up, this part setup user form appears. And this is being generated by a macro that's in the design binder. And this is kind of cool because uh, maybe at my company, as soon as a part is opened, I always want the user to be able to easily change the material if he wants, and then also maybe change a custom property called edited by. And that way you can track the last person that edited the part. So we'll apply those, add it, and again, it's just running that macro in there. But now watch what happens if I rebuild this notice that the user form doesn't pop up again. And I can save this and reopen it. 
and there the user form has popped up again. So basically I'm controlling the macro in such a way that it only occurs one time and that's initially when the part opens. So how did I get all this to occur? Well basically what I did is as soon as the macro runs the first time I suppressed that equation within the equation manager. Of course as soon as the part is saved that suppressed equation would normally be saved so you'd open the part and it'd be suppressed and this wouldn't pop up again yet we saw that it did pop up. So what I did to allow that to occur is the macro is also listening for the user to save the part and as soon as it, as soon as the user saves the part quickly unsuppresses the equation lets the save happen and then resuppresses it so the end user doesn't even notice now I thought it'd really be nice to implement this kind of flexibility in any equation triggered macro so I actually created a special class that you can include in any of your macros that lets you control when and how often they run so let me open up that Basically, the code that lets you accomplish all that flexibility is found in this class, ETMUtil, which stands for Equation Triggered Macro Utility. And all you're going to do is you're going to get the active part, and then you're going to declare a new instance of that class. And right here is just some error handling. I'm just testing to make sure that a model is open and that it's not a drawing because you can't use equations and drawings. And then right here, we're specifying the arguments that work with ETMUtil. So specifically, we're going to specify the active document. And then we're going to say true if we want to run the macro once when the part opens. For the next argument, we can say true if we want that save listener to unsuppress and then resuppress when a save occurs. So this would only be used in conjunction with the first argument. And then the third argument I created is if you do want the macro to run on every rebuild, but never more than once within a particular time span. So you can actually specify a number of seconds here, and even if you rebuild 10 times within that 30 second period, the macro will only run once. And then lastly, I have this delete temp files argument. And the reason I have that in there is because when you run a macro from a design binder, it actually gets saved to a temporary folder and then it gets run. And so if you run the macro 10 times, there's going to be 10 temporary files, but there's a bug in SolidWorks that basically does not delete those temporary files. So they end up becoming permanent and they can take up space on your hard drive. So maybe that would never be a problem on your computer because you have lots of space, but just in case you want to delete those temporary files, I included this argument uh, for true or false if you don't want to. So anyway, once you've specified these arguments, then down here is where you would include your code that accomplishes whatever task you want. So whether it's renaming bodies or sorting custom properties, or in our case, if we go back to the macro that uh, is running when our current part opens, what's happening is it's uh, setting up the ETM util the way we want, and then it's showing that form where the user can specify the material or custom property. So again, this ETM util that's designed to be implemented in any macro you want, and it doesn't just have to be implemented in a macro you're running from the design binder. It can be a macro that you have located on your hard drive, and it just allows you more flexibility in the frequency of when and how often your macro will be run when you're using equation-triggered macros. And this is available to premium members at cadsharp.com. So with that, if you have any more questions about equation-triggered macros, check out the very detailed post I have on the subject at cadsharp.com. And thanks for watching.